Okay, the meeting is now being recorded. All right, welcome everyone to our meeting of the EDM IAB program, Evolvability, Deployability, and Maintainability. Um, thank you for joining us. And I think we have several kind of new faces here, probably from our um, working group chairs list outreach. So thank you for coming along. All right, uh, first, just some updates. Uh, we published the use it or lose it draft. Um, so that's now RFC 9170. So good job, uh, everyone, for helping us uh, review that and get that over the finish line. Uh, today, uh, there are a couple things we wanted to cover. First being the results of the a survey that we sent out to the working group chairs list on implementation status and tracking. Just getting that out in front of people so we can understand what the feedback was in general. And then talk about some of the next steps for implementation status, as well as uh, code tracking some of the stuff that uh, Charles Eckel had brought up. And was also discussed on uh, the list. And then after that, we also want to get back to an item that we've discussed previously. Um, and now that we've published user lose it, we want to see, you know, do we want to do something with uh, Martin Thompson's draft, uh, the IB protocol maintenance, which is expired, but is an adopted IAB document and seems like it would be in scope for this program. All right. Unless there are any objections, let's get started. All right, so we sent out uh, a survey on implementation status based on our last meeting um, to try to understand kind of the scope of things that different working groups were tracking and what they were interested in tracking to help with protocol deployment and understanding um, kind of the health of protocol deployments. So this is an example of what went out. I'm sure a lot of you on this call took that or took a look at that survey. So thank you for filling that out. Um, for the responses, we got uh, 38 working groups responding overall, which is, I think, pretty good. Um, and what I'll go through now is just a summary of the results in kind of graph form so we can understand in general what people are saying. And then we can discuss what we think kind of the conclusions are, what we should do about it. So first we were asking, you know, does your working group track implementation status for the protocols you work on um, currently? And about three quarters of groups responded that they do track in some manner. Uh, a higher percentage, 82%, were interested in having the implementation status of the protocols be more discoverable. Um, and you know, presumably that's for people reading the specs or for people working in the working group so they can understand how implementations are coming along. And also a very high percentage, 87%, were interested in looking at how you could track implementation status after RFCs are published. Um, and that also would potentially include after working groups have closed or have finished their work. Uh, for some more detailed questions, we asked, what um, how working groups actually track running code or share status of implementations. And, and so for this, people could select multiple different answers. So you know slightly less than half of the working groups polled uh, had some status of running code being tracked in hackathons. 11% used uh, interim meetings, a bit over half, 53%. Uh, would use uh, working group presentations to keep updated on status. 61% track something in a GitHub repo somewhere, and then 30% were other. And then looking at the other, some of that was just mailing list. Uh, one group mentioned the European Advanced Networking Test Center. Uh, people mentioned the implementation status section on internet drafts, uh, shepherd write-ups that would uh, be added before going up to the ISG and then bakeathons. 
And then as far as tracking implementation status, 42% of the groups uh, said that they use the um, internet draft section on implementation status in some form. Uh, relatively few, 11% uh, use the IETF track wiki, same percent use a GitHub wiki, 16% are using hackathon wiki, 13% are using GitHub pages. Uh, so there's a big diversity of little things here or there that doesn't seem to be any consistent trend. And we didn't include a none option, so pretty much uh, everything else, 55% was people saying other, but writing in none, with one person also writing in that they use Google Sheets. So that is the output of uh, that survey. I guess let's pause here before we go into kind of other topics um, for what we do with this. Uh, I see Miria was saying bakeathon. I think a bakeathon was just how someone termed they were doing um, for interop code testing. I'm not sure exactly what it refers to. Um, all right, uh, Paul, raise a hand. And people, you can feel free to just chime in. I think we're a small group. I will chime and not hand. Um, I was, since I'm no longer blue dotted, I was, I didn't see the survey. Ah. Um, was there any question or any suggestion of would people, would working group chairs who are answering the survey like to see the implementation status across the IETF collected somewhere? And if so, hmm. what were their answers? We did not have a question on that specifically, although I think that kind of, if, if anything, falls into the, you know, is there a more discoverable way to see implementation status? Like, is there a way on data structure to just see, like, how are things being implemented? And maybe that is a thing that's visible more across the ITF. I think that would be useful. Right. And, and, and my question comes because I know some working groups there, you know, once you're in the working group, you hear about the st the implementation status tracker. But if you're outside the working group, you wouldn't have any idea because it's a working group function, and it's something that you would only find out if you were on the mailing list. Um, a as a very concrete example of this, um, in the DNS world, we have at times started and and not started uh, conformance, you know, tracking and some some mm -hmm. interoperability tracking just. Sort of, and when I've told people, oh yeah, we could do this, like the HTTP people are very active on this, I universally get surprise. Whereas anyone in the HTTP world just gets bludgeoned with it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it would be good, in, in my mind, it would be good if nothing else, that there was a cross IETF or through the IEB or something indicator that that this does happen and that there are these myriad ways of it happening. Yeah, that, that that makes sense. Um to to what degree do you think you know because yeah, we could always have some cross IETF or IAB statement on hey, these things are happening. Um but I think you know part of the thought and what we were talking about last time was you know maybe it's is it in data tracker as an associated metadata? Is it associated metadata with a draft or an RFC of like here's the way to just link over to the page where you track this. And that way it's a blank that people can understand can be filled in. And even if you're looking at a working group or a document you're not familiar with, you can see, ah, this is how these people track this, or this is how they do conformance testing. I don't know if that was aimed at me specifically. I would love to hear from other people. Um, to, in my mind, uh, if this, um, questionnaire mostly went to working group chairs, then we're mostly talking about working groups or individual drafts within working groups being tracked. And so it would be something that would maybe come from the ISG. It might be just an annual blog post. Yeah. Or maybe it's both, yeah, a blog post that summarizes the things that we've annotated and learned, yeah. But um, I see, I see there's some chat going on, so people can also chime in there. So let me chime in, if you don't mind, Please. Uh, to me. Uh, this is quite cool, but I think we need to really target some very specific protocol there. For instance, 
If we want to track the implementation of RAC 8200, a PV6, we will end up with a way too long list, it's useless. So we may want to track very specific newcomers or whatever, I don't know. And conformance testing is a vastly different world. I will not touch it with a pole, but yeah. That's fair. Um, that's something needs to be done, that's for sure. Yeah. Do some of the people who are commenting in chat wanna speak up? Can I add a comment on this last comment of Eric? Um, Please. If we take the example of uh, the implementation of, of 8200, I mean, the question is, how long do, do we need to track the implementation? Like forever? So, I mean, because 8200, we have a lot of implementation and this, for some protocols, this keep going, for other not, but uh, it's a matter of for how long as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and there certainly is a distinction between, you know, during protocol development and spec development of, oh, did you implement this draft? Did you do this versus, how many boxes in the world support IPv6, which is vastly different now. This is another aspect, yeah. And, uh, and Paul, one additional issue is also that um, there's a good reason that we've removed the implementation status section before publication, because otherwise it becomes like an advertisement clause, right? Um, so I'm, I'm a little wary with like us tracking things versus it becoming an advertisement for mm. the implementations. You know, one thing I wanted to bring up is I, I think there's sort of uh, the two different targets for this. The one that, that we're talking about maybe a little bit more is the uh, during the uh, development of a protocol, tracking what's going on, having that feedback into the spec as it's actively being developed by the working group. Uh, that, that's that's really important to do. And then I, you know, I'd like to see us uh, improve mechanisms for doing that and are kind of get a bit more consistent in how we do that. But I also think it's really important to be able to track after the fact um, and uh, to you know, continue to have that information after an RFC is published. And really for people who are not in the working group, for just people who want to implement it um, so that they can see here, hey, you know, here's some code that is uh, related to what's been going on with this uh, this RFC, maybe that code's useful to me to help me start my implementation. Maybe it's a cool <clears throat> um, test tool that helps me um, work with it. Maybe it's a plugin for um, you know something I can use to sniff the traffic on the wire and and debug it better. Uh, those types of things I think are really important to developers and would help us get protocols uh, developed more widely. Uh, in the future, if we made it available, and, and just easy to find. So, what's the life cycle of the kind of thing that you were talking about just then? So, I I, I can see having this collection of resources easy to find being useful um early in the development of a of a document and of a protocol but as um some folks have pointed out in the chat um the lists of resources like that tend to either become um popularity contests or or dead link graveyards um within a few years mm -hmm. um, so understanding you know martin asked in the in the chat who is the tracking for so one of the audiences that that you were pointing out charles is um um implementers that are early on the implementation curve and i'd like to refine that as to when the implementate when when the world's implementation curve is at the beginning or if it's something that you think should live on into you know the 
future decades to help new implementers of old protocols. Yeah, I was thinking more the latter that it should it should live on, and uh, there wouldn't be as many updates to it at that point. And sure, some information might get uh, a bit stale if no one's actively uh, maintaining that page. But uh, the thought being that it, it at least provides a, a jumping off point to get to, um, say, various. Uh, an example, it takes you to a GitHub repo, and once you go to that GitHub repo, you may find that that. Uh, the code that it was pointing you to is no longer really actively being maintained, um, or perhaps you find that it is. So it, I still think having that link is is useful and does more benefit than harm uh, having it there. So when it's we're earlier on in the cycle, this information would be fresher, and probably the people working on the working group chairs, many people would be looking at it and keeping it uh, as up to date as possible. And I could see where that would slow down over time. But I still think it's useful and more useful to to have something there than not have anything at all. Other comments? There is, you know, still active chat going on. Um, Alexi, did you want to kind of express what you were thinking as far as the value of these? To be honest, uh, Charles, I think done a better job than I did. You know, the availability of uh, on the wire track, uh, you know, plugins and debugging tools and things to test against. You know, if you're writing client, you want the server to test with maybe with some test accounts or at least you know person to contact to talk. You know, to get one, this sort of thing. And I still, yeah, I also think that stale information is still better than no information. Mm -hmm. Having run a, conf a sort of well-known conformance test suite for a while uh, when the VPN consortium was active, um, I can absolutely speak to the fact that um, it is an advertising mechanism mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. That is, after you have the three biggest players who obviously are supposed to conform or interoperate with each other, having having something that gets smaller companies wanting to be involved and finding conformance issues, or at least having them know if you want to be on this chart, you're going to get red marks unless you do this set of extensions, um, worked very well for the uh, IPsec industry uh, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Worked similarly well for IMAP. So, Tommy, I heard in your um, early discussion a question about whether or not there needed to be any normalization of how different groups capture mm -hmm. this information, or at least capture pointers to this information. Right. So, you know, we the tools that we've got available right now, you can put arbitrary links from a documents page or from a groups page um, using the additional um, resources um, capabilities um, for the data tracker to point to whatever content you have. Um, our story on wikis is weak right now. We've still got Wiki.js that's coming available that working groups could put um, things on wikis and there are lots of groups that are putting things on GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, I know that in the past there was um, conversations about actually having a, a, a very purposed tool that looked more like a marketplace that was this, um, the, um, um, the, the code, something. Um, yes. I, had the exact same stumble as I got code and didn't didn't get further. But yes, you know, do we, do we do we need something code match? Yeah, do we need something that is that purposed, or do we just need um, to? Are people would we do better if we than we are from zero if we just um, started working with consistently getting pointers from pages in the data tracker or pointers from inside the document to um, the larger collection of things that are out there? 
Right. And I, I think, you know, based on the discussion that we saw on the chairs list saying, oh, yeah, code match was this thing and trying to build this whole app and trying to import it was like, it, you know, it, it fizzled out. I, I don't think that's a successful direction to go in. And we did capture um, the program GitHub issue around this and the discussion there was also, you know, saying it's probably yeah more important to have a standard pointer that people can know, oh, this is where I look when I'm reading a document or looking at a state tracker page versus having at least initially a some common way to host that because everyone's going to have a different conformance test or wiki about their current status, but it's a way that yeah, working group chairs or document authors can say, hey, if you want to join in on the fun or if we want to have new people learn how to participate in this and share their implementation status or learn what they can test against, that there's a clear place to put that. Yeah, and I, I think the stuff in the chat is kind of going along that direction. Um, a Andrew, I saw you had a question around this topic of having a different tracking options. I guess, were you expressing any opinion in that? Because I think, you know, we'd lean towards saying have many different tracking options with maybe eventually at some point some templates, but the point would be to have a common pointer or link or button that you can get to. I suppose, uh, Tommy, I was just uh, thought it was worth asking the question because I know there's a predisposition within the ITF that, uh, you know, why have one tool when 20 are available? Um, so I thought I would just gently ask the question whether there will be any merit in in suggesting at least um, a, a reduced set, whether that would give any, any advantage, but slightly tongue in cheek, I guess, in a way, but sometimes mm -hmm. choice isn't always helpful. Um, yeah, understood. I imagine a first pass though would just be helping groups that are already doing efforts to make what they're doing discoverable rather than trying to have people change what they do necessarily. Yep. Um, okay, so I, I think the concrete thing here seems to be like, yeah, let's have, you know, some URL that we can point to. Um, so concretely, uh, um, you know, Robert, you were mentioning, you know, we can, we can do additional resources in the data tracker page. When I look at that, that does have kind of like the valid tags list. I assume I could, like, you could put other URLs, but, you know, if we wanted something there, would it make sense to define a new tag? Is that what you're thinking or no? You could use the exist any of the existing tabs now. You know, there's there there is our our generic tags for additional information. You know, website kind of tags. And if you wanted it, if you wanted a specific tag for um, implementation tracking, adding that tag would not be a difficult thing to do. Okay. And for those types of metadata. Does that only show up on the data tracker page? Because um, I think there's also been discussion of, you know, in some of the rendered um, HTML documents, um, do there get to be links in that or does that get to be a more complicated issue? Links rendering into the document if that's like what you course. really mean, would be very difficult. If you mean like in the HTMLization pages, having yes. links show up at the top, that would not be yeah. difficult. That, 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 that's what, like where they currently have, oh, here's how you get back to the tracker or how you get to the working group page or whatever. Right. And I guess those only show up in the kind of older HTML, HTMLized format. They don't show up in the, pretty HTTP3. Yeah. HTML, the rendered HTML is just the document, not yeah, document right. plus metadata in any of the views that we currently have. Is that, just out of curiosity, is that intended to remain that way kind of indefinitely or like 
Always, you know, what are the pressures, right? The RFC editor is wrapping the um, rendered HTML with at least JavaScript that um, adds additional dressing, and we could provide a view that did the same thing. You know, there are trade offs about whether or not you want those links to be discoverable to things like um, search engines that, that have to be explored. Uh, Luigi, you had your hand raised. Feel free to jump in. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I was wondering if it, it would make sense to have a, a tab actually in the working group um, data tracker page. We have about documents, meetings, history, this stuff. And what if we have an additional tab that says implementation? And then you can somehow put whatever you want there. Either you go, you link to something else, the working group is using or you 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 just have a template that allows you to put information that is needed uh, and that not only the chairs can update maybe also uh, the various contributors that, that would help and uh, in 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 keeping it uh, up to date up to some point uh, at least until the the working group is is closed i would say now the question would be what kind of format that that page should have, but yeah, but, but we can also think of something uh, along these lines. Yeah, I hear that idea, but would encourage us not to uh, pursue that until we had a more evidence of a more consistent adoption of a normalized form. I agree that we need a normalized form. Uh, it's just that a benefit that can can be done later. I'm not saying this is the starting point, but mm -hmm. uh, if there is a, a tool directly in the data tracker, um, uh, maybe it will be used not only by the, the 38 chairs that answered to the survey and that are interested in it, but may, maybe slowly, slowly other people will, will start to use it. So then depends on not all working groups have they do really track implementations. It really depends, but um, may help at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, thinking about what things look like in that direction is interesting. I agree with Robert that, you know, something small, concrete, when we know what is consistent makes more sense. Um, but certainly interesting to think in that direction. Uh, re regarding people other than chairs being able to do things. Um, you know, obviously I think only the chairs would be able to edit the additional resource links on a working group page, but you know, at least for an individual draft, authors should be able to change that for their own documents. And I guess what, what's, the, what's the status, if it's an adopted working group document, can the chairs, are the chairs the only ones who can modify that? That's correct. Yeah, but I think that's, appropriate um at this point so that seems like a good boundary to have well, one question i had is how much of the the uh, the information we'd want to track would be uh per working group versus per uh, per draft or per rfc because it seems like we have cases of, of both and i heard some people talking about having something on the working group page but in some cases um I imagine different drafts could have very different sets of implementation resources associated with them. And, and certainly once they become RFC, um, right. it, it'd be separate. Yeah, I, I think if you have a, as people are talking about the chat, a tag that you can add, a standardized tag that you can put in your additional resources for both working groups and documents. Mm -hmm. If you have a working group approach that does everything, then put it at your working group level, probably also copy that onto the individual documents that you have adopted that are relevant. If they are separate per document, have a separate link per document, and maybe the working group has like their top level wiki that links you to all of the document implementation statuses or tests they're doing. Um, it seems like you know, it's just having the tag would be useful for all of those different cases. Eric. Yeah, and the tag is a nice way, easy to, to start with. 
But my major concern is what will happen when the working group close. So who is then able to update those tags? Uh, and the other point is when do we remove this information? Right. To come back to the VPN consortium from Paul 15 or 20 years ago, uh, I guess information has disappeared, right? It's not more very useful. Everything can be solved, by the way. Right. Um, you know, to some degree, maybe a feature, not a bug at this point to you know, not have links actively maintained for published documents or closed working groups, since that's a sticky area of like, we know it's going to get stale. Um, I guess it'd be good to confirm, Robert. So when you have metadata tags on a working group and the working group closes, I assume those just stay. Yeah, they continue to exist. Um, permissions tend to um, uh, fall back to the ISG and the secretariat if they were um, IETF working groups. And if they're research groups, the IRSG and the secretariat, that, that kind of um, fall back up leadership chains yep oh cool. makes sense yep i think this is kind of the appropriate thing to do for now so i guess what i would propose coming out of this is we can bike shed uh names for a tag uh talk about maybe some candidate groups that are doing this type of stuff that want to add it in add that in um you know potentially Charles, um, also, you know, along with hackathon work as you have people to participate in that, um, make that known as an option, um, kind of onboard people to that and see how that can become useful for people. I'd like to toss one small suggestion in with what you just said, Tommy, Please. which is that the IESG itself can also create these, um, specifically in the DNS world. Mm. DNS op has become a default working group, but lots yeah. of DNS -y things for which this kind of implementation things would be appropriate are not part of DNS op at all. So, but, but some AD could say, oh, look, here's, here is a group of people who are ITF regulars who seem to be doing this. Yes, this should exist as well. Yep. That makes sense. And I certainly imagine you could have a common resource that is across working groups and across documents that like hey all of the dns groups kind of here's their conformance place if that exists well but Directors. to be more specific no one is actually looking at rfc 1034 1035 which are sure. dns sure but a conformance you know or an implementation especially on um types that are no longer used this comes up sometimes individuals do it and it would just be nice if an AD can say, look, some individuals over here um, mm -hmm. are keeping this useful list. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question of where do you advertise that um, as like, a useful thing? But yeah, that can be discussed. Great. All right. Um, I think, you know, looking at the slides that I had after this, we already had some issues for the program covering this, but I think we talked through pretty much everything. I think we have a pretty good next step. Um, the one other bit, let me share the slides again here, um, was originally before we got into the implementation status, half of it, we did have Charles, your draft on finding code. And I, I just noted, you know, we did have the, working group discussion, the working group chairs list discussion around kind of the previous failed attempt of this code match uh, thing. Charles, what are you thinking around the kind of like the code aspect, which is a little bit different than just interop and implementation status? Or do you think that kind of adding these tags is still um, a good first step for some of the things you were thinking of? Um, in your draft. Yeah, I guess in, in my draft, I was thinking of things uh, like I, I mentioned, you know, tools, other things that would just help someone who is implementing, uh, maintaining, debugging, uh, doing anything to do with, with that really a, a protocol. 
that uh, the ITF would standardize. So it would be, um, I was thinking I, I would, you know, um, abuse this tag if that's, if it's an abuse, yeah. but I'd use it for, it'd use the same tag to for like really any code that is useful mm -hmm. and related to the, uh, the draft or RFC. If, if that's yeah. reasonable to people, that's kind of what I had in mind. I think that makes sense. Um, it, it seems Making like a bunch of tags or something like that. Right. It, like essentially have, you know, we'll need to bike shed name and brainstorm that. But if the core of this is, you know, this is your implementation info, you know, that can be just your status. That can be your conformance testing results that can be other guides, like what you're saying of, Hey, if you're writing this protocol, here's some useful resources. Yeah. And I think it also points to the obviously have to be more information, uh, but at least you, you need a, a jumping, you need something to get you to where you know, the information is. And then it'd be up to the people, you know, writing the tool to make it clear. Well, this is a tool that's meant to help you with this. And, you know, we just developed it yesterday or it's been used quite a lot and found to be completely, you know, in line with the latest draft. And so that type of information would be, you know, two levels away from you, but at least you'd yes. be on your path to get there. That's right. Okay, very good. Um, think uh, if, if, if unless anyone has anything else, I want to move on to our second topic, talking about protocol maintenance draft. Well, well just one, one thing I was wondering is: is it uh, are we going to try to do some sort of uh, you know implement something along this or some type of experiment for in time for the next IETF meeting? Um, I think so. If there's like a few working groups that want to. Uh, make use of it, and then we can make sure that it's, you know, uh, useful for a hackathon project related to those working groups might just be a good way to test it out and see how it goes. Exactly. I, I think what my plan would be, would be, you know, let's go back to the EDM list. If people care about this stuff and you're not on that list, please join it. Um, we can talk about what the tag should be, what the name is. And then I assume Robert, we just talked to you about getting that added to the list. And then we talked to you, Charles, about telling people in the hackathon to do it. We reach back out to the working group chairs list and say, hey, if you were interested in this in the survey, maybe let's try this out and point it to one of the places you already have, talk to your working group about it. Um, it can also be the type of thing you know, IB can go and work with IESG. Um, we've done things in the past couple of times of saying, hey, when the ADs are talking to the working group chairs, prior to the meeting, just let them know, hey, hey, these are things available to you, or maybe this is kind of like a theme that we can bring up in different working groups that you're coming, that people are going to, so that people can become more aware of this and start thinking about it more. Great. Okay, um, moving on. The other thing we wanted to bring up on the maintenance side and getting more into documents is this uh, document that we have that's expired draft IAB protocol maintenance, the harmful consequences of the robustness principle. Um, it's adopted, as I mentioned before, it's expired. It only expired a few weeks ago. Yes, Martin, but it's yeah, it's good, good, good reason to look at it again. Um, and this definitely is in scope for a IAB program that has maintenance in the name. So I guess, Martin, since you are here, if you want to just summarize what it says, you could probably do that better than I. If you want to speak up. Or not. Is that working out? Yep. Headphones. Um, so this is probably one of the more controversial things that I've written. Um, it's changed a lot since the early versions. Um, I don't think that there's uniform agreement that this is a philosophy that it, uh, is applicable in all contexts. Uh, it's probably one of the things that uh, work in a group like this might help with. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's there's a number of different um, portions of the community that sort of strongly believe that um, the robustness principle is not, not an appropriate basis for the way that um, protocols are designed. 
part of the thesis here is that there's maintenance that occurs on a on a protocol that somewhat avoids the need to apply this principle and so it goes into a little bit more detail about that um, i don't know what we might do here to sort of balance the two competing concerns um, that's really what i'm looking for input on here mm -hmm. um, if this is going to be published, it's going to need a little bit of balance in that regard. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, and so the questions I had on this for this program was, you know, do we agree or not? I think as a community, as people working in the ITF, that you know, something should be said here. Should we take it on in this group to? try to refine balance the document or uh, define the scope of it so people are comfortable with how it's applying and i'd love to hear if people have suggestions for how it could be changed or updated or if people do agree or disagree um tommy if i could suggest a, a slight variation of your question please. um the I think Martin was pushing that um, discussion in the program about not necessarily publishing the draft or, or just trying to understand where the where the 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 concepts in the draft make sense to apply versus um, mm -hmm. other things would would um, mm -hmm. if that discussion bore any fruit it would it would um, be a very very valuable thing to have and a program like this is more likely to to provide a good focus um to to bring that discussion to a useful conclusion than just um leaving it out for general discussion in the community um, yeah. yeah so i i actually would like the the program to um have some focused discussion around um what what the draft is saying and and where the philosophy then in it really applies you know i don't want to dive in too deep to to right now but what an early question that i would ask in the program would be if we've got any measure of um the communities that think that the philosophies that are in this draft are really good are implementation communities that have a small number of big players or um, um, versus a, a a very large number of very small players, um, or if we could even gather that kind of information to see if the attitudes change depending on what the ecosystem for the protocols that um, are being worked on looks like. Yep. Yeah. So using the scale of how how many players are in the ecosystem and how widely deployed each of them are, how does that change the ap applicability of this? Yeah, that's good. And pretty similar to what Robert said, uh, never read the draft, right? So I agree somehow with the principle, but not for all cases, right? That's for sure if you are developing a browser on a well-known platform, you can update. Now, if you are developing something for an IoT device, it stays there for 15 years old, obviously you cannot, right? You need to rely on the robustness. So, again, I've not read the draft, yeah, if you are saying in the ATF, um, but is it about providing consideration, the pros and the cons, or is it more doing a recommendation, you should do this? I mean, not, not to put words in Martin's mouth, but I, I think the way at least the draft you know, originally came out, it seemed to be, you know, you, we have this institutional principle of the robustness principle that we're all used to. And then, you know, kind of to challenge that there's a statement of like, you know, you just, someone wants to come out and say, no, that's wrong. Um, this, you know, particularly for what you're bringing up here, like these cases where you can update and you are maintaining it, that doesn't make sense and is actually harmful. Um, and probably where we need to end up through is, you know, let, let those two things bump around in the the polishing chamber for the rocks and like see what comes out the other side um 
of where where do you draw that line? Um, because I think we can easily point to extremes on both sides where one approach is fine, the other approach is much more correct. I was going to say, Carlson raised an interesting point mm -hmm. um, about the the difference between the need for for the ability to update things and the facts on the ground, which is that in in the IoT world, uh, it has been the case and probably will continue to be the case that a lot of devices don't get updates, and a large component of this is sort of based on the the understanding that in order to deploy to the internet you should really have an update process and you know we've had a number of working groups that have explored the problem i think that that this is something that will continue to be attention particularly in constrained environments and will push towards a, a particular outcome the area that i find a little more interesting is those settings where the, the pace of deployment is historically relatively slow. It's not mm -hmm. that there's no active maintenance involved, it's that the pace of deployment tends to, to be somewhat more um, measured. If you think about um, people deploying to routers and things like that, um, they tend to be very conservative in, in the way that they do software rollouts because of the um, size of the impact if a mistake occurs. So um, those are the sorts of things that I'd, I'd like to talk about. To some extent, I want to sort of rule the IoT thing, like in the just completely out of scope in, in a sense, because if someone's unwilling to update their software, then maybe we need to we need to talk about whether they they get to continue to participate. What one question I have out of this, and I think. It goes to Robert's comment on chat about you know, what would happen if people were just strict. Um, it, it seems to me that one of the reasons you would be liberal in what you accept is that you want to deal with future changes to the protocol that you may not predict um, that otherwise could end up breaking you. But when we combine this with some of the work we were doing in Use It or Lose It of talking more concretely about greasing or you know making sure that your extension points are usable um it, it, i guess you know to people who are doing more iot work if i have an iot device that's never going to be updated how bad would it be for it to be very strict with saying because i know i only support this version of this protocol can we design that in such a way that you know sure it's not going to crash or it's not going to do something terrible when a bit gets used for something new, but it just accepts the fact that it will not understand future things that um, essentially say, no, be be conservative of what it expects and just understand that that will never change. Is that okay? Yeah, there's, um, there's with, the use it all is it basically said it, you, you define very clearly what the expectations are with respect to extensibility. And if, you're, if your design space says, we're not going to accept any more features on this protocol, then that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. In the same way that, that HTML is de deliberately tolerant of, of user input errors uh, and it is almost aggressive, like some people will characterize that as almost aggressively um, a, an application of the robustness principle that is it is not in fact and the, and the draft talks about this it, it is in fact a very precise specification now and that um that specification has a purpose on the opposite end of the scale the iot device that doesn't expect to operate for uh, expects to operate for the next 15 years without software updates might want a very much more narrowly defined protocol with yes. no extensibility yes um, Miria, you have your hand up. I I wanted to um, say that I think this draft is about protocol maintenance and not necessarily software updates, right? And software maintenance. 
Um, and I think there is some very useful advice here and in line with what you both just said, I believe um, that we should be more explicit, but explicit about like how our maintenance look like, how often do we want to revise versions? How static is a protocol? Is it still work in progress or is it kind of done? And I think it's actually generally a, a bad expectation to have like this protocol and single people it's done and would never change as it was kind of the case for TCP for many years. Um, so we should we should bring the message out that we we want to be more active and and people should um, expect to see more versions of all kind of protocols um, and and need to um, figure out what to do if a new version comes up and so on. And I think this is only um, uh, partly related to the robustness principle. I think there is a, kind of an over interpretation of this inter in, uh, principle, but I think. Giving, putting out a message about how important protocol maintains is, is would be more important for this draft and should be more in scope or more focus of the draft than just talking about the bad sides of the robustness principle. Mm -hmm. Martin, you made a comment in the chat about software maintenance and its relation to protocol maintenance. What were you thinking there? I, I think. Um, let me try this again. Uh, I think that probably the 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 core realization that I had working through this was that um, the the two go hand in hand, and if you if you expect one to evolve, then then the other has to has to evolve with it. Uh, that's one of the things that we saw with with TCP. I think was that. Because uh, nothing was happening in the in the um, implementation land, nothing would happen in the specification land, and and it sort of kept itself in a in a very nice stagnant state for I don't know what is it thirty years, um, and so slow pace there meant slow pace on on both ends. That's okay. Um, it's not necessarily a problem. No, and I mean, this is true, but I think the message or, of this draft should be, and we should be more active. We should not get ourselves into this situation again. And we should be more clear about how we maintain protocols so that implementations can rely on this. Yeah, yeah I, I think that is that is the direction that, that I've been taking this. I, I, again, maybe not very well. And we can probably try to revise that. Mm -hmm. So, Two things. One is uh, DNS has had exactly the same problem TCP has, and has had the exact same thing of we don't it, we have an extension mechanism. Let's let's do everything in there. Let's not actually work on the base protocol, even though we know there are are a couple of important places where it really could be fixed easily with a, a new version that people agree to. Um, but Martin, going to your your last statement about maybe it's not. Maybe you're not reflecting it really well in the current draft. I unfortunately would agree with you there because I really liked where the draft started a few years ago. And now, like what I think the part that Miria was just speaking to of um, more protocol development happening, uh, you know, or re redevelopment happening is important, is now sort of lost all the way in section five. I would love to see that bubble up uh, closer to the top. That's good input. I, I'll I'll take another look at it, and with that with that feedback in mind, um, if anyone is able to help me, that would be great. I think over um, chat, I was talking to David, and I think David was willing to help out. Yeah, I would love to spend some time on this one. I think it's really important, and I I'm going to have a some number of cycles in the coming months. So happy to help here. Good. All right. Um, I am. Conscious of the time, we have three minutes left until the hour, and I have a HTTP meeting coming up. So if anyone's coming over there, uh, feel free to join us there. Um, yeah, I, so I think we'll wrap up here, unless anyone has any burning comments. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I think we made some good progress, and uh, we will chat more on the list, and Robert will get back to you with a tag sometime soon. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.